Claire. And then I think, so Christy, um, Paige sent it to you, I think, um, through Box last time. Whatever she, however she sent it, it was great. And we were able okay. to, yeah. So whatever she did worked and we were able to successfully get that loaded onto our website. So yeah, it worked great. Awesome. That's what I'll plan to do again. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't a part of any of the technical um, gotcha. part of that, but I did, I did just watch it uh, the other day. I was thinking about using it. Um, I was going to use a little segment of it um, in my class and I was watching it just to kind of see if I could pare it down a little. So yeah, it was, it was, it was very good. Y'all did a very great job. <laughs> we try, we try sometimes, but I feel like we say, we say things a little differently every time that we do it, but I yeah. hope we improve it every time that we. Oh, I, I bet you do. I bet <laughs> so. Keeps Jill, are it interesting. You the, are you at the office today? Nope. I am in my dining room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your background looks good. I like it. Yeah, thanks. They made these for us because I'm sure they were sick of seeing our paintings and chairs and different things in the background of our yep. meetings. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I like Heather just uh, said that she did the video stuff. Thank you, Heather, for doing the video yeah, stuff. She did. I <laughs> knew. So I don't have, for some reason, or I guess I can go to my view. I can't see. It's in the Q&A. She put it in the Q&A. Oh, got it. Okay. I like that view better. You can see everybody instead of. Yeah. Oh yeah, no speaker view. I'm not a fan. I like to see everyone. Yeah, it feels really odd when you talk to <laughs> for your face to get really big. It's like, oh, I'll be quiet now. And then, <laughs> yeah. I know that's why these webinars. We, um, I mean, it, it's nice to not, you know, because it's easier when you don't know how many people are going to come and all that. But yeah, I definitely like seeing people's faces, so it doesn't feel like I'm just talking to myself. But I know, I know. Sometimes the webinar version is the best way to go. Uh, it's to Jill. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are y'all ready to get started? Mm -hmm. I see that Ron has his hand up, but I honestly don't even know now I allow Ron to talk. I'm not very good at the webinar stuff. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> oh, yes, Ron. So, uh, so this is these webinar because it is set up in Zoom webinar. So these will be more like presentations. So Jill and I will kind of present um, some content. We'll challenge you guys to do a few things with the content, but just for time's sake and for uh, just you know, having, you know, sometimes larger groups than others, we, you won't be able to like chat or, um, or unmute yourself to talk. However, if you have any, if you guys have any questions as we go through, feel free to put it in the Q and A and we will address those at the end. All right. So I think, I think Christy is going to kind of kick us off today. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll ask you in a minute if you were here. Um, I don't know, Christy, do you want me to do that before you go? Yeah, go ahead. We'll go ahead and do that. So I'm going to launch a poll that's just going to ask you to, to answer if you came to the last session or even if you weren't in that session, if you watched it um, on your own time. So if you guys will just take a moment to answer that so we get a feel for how many people are new, or how many people received the information before. Half and half, it looks like. Yeah, so we have eight no's and seven yeses. All right, thank you guys so much. So we are going to, um, it's not going to be redundant in any way to what was um, presented in the first session. So if you like what you hear today and you think that this is interesting, please feel free to go back and watch the first session that we did. It was more about stress and how stress, stress impacts the brain in both positive and negative ways and how to kind of leverage stress for good. So if that's something that you're interested in, feel free to go back 
and I'm sure Christy can, pro can provide more information on where to find that, um, but please feel free to go back and watch that um, as well. Today, we're gonna be more so talking about cognitive resources and how to be more intentional about how you're using your daily resources. Um, but if you are interested in stress and the impact it has on the brain, please feel free to go back and watch uh, the first one. Great, yes. And I'm gonna actually um, throw Heather Medley under the bus. She's used to it. She, I, I throw her under the bus all the time. But Heather, if you'll put that maybe in the, um, you know, in the comments or somewhere where people can see where to access that. I know it's on our website. I just don't know exactly um, where. So I know Heather does and I know she can help us find that. So you can see that I'm standing here today with um, someone and you may be wondering why I recruited someone to come stand next to me. Um, Ashley Davis has joined our team um, at the Teaching and Learning Center. She's our new uh, design coordinator and program evaluator for the Title V program. So she's our newest addition um, here in the Teaching and Learning Center. We're so happy that she's here. Um, so Ashley has made several comments about how excited she is to see all of the innovative things happening at South Queens College. Um, and she knows what she's talking about. So she was a dual credit student at South Queens College and um, she graduated from Leveland High School as the valedictorian. She attended uh, West Texas A&M. And then she came back to Leveland where she taught in the middle school. She taught middle school science. So nothing scares Ashley, nothing, because she taught middle school kids. Um, so anyway, we welcome Ashley to South Plains College. I want you to see her face and know her name. She's gonna be um, moving around in all of the departments, helping us as we look at all of the new and exciting things that we're doing uh, through the Title V grant. And by the way, the Title V grant um, is responsible for uh, funding this um, exciting uh, talk that we're having today. So we sure appreciate all the work that's gone into um, the Title V funding. So Ashley, welcome to South Plains College. Uh, is there anything you want to say? No, just that I'm okay. really excited to be here and to be able to work with such wonderful people and learn from you guys as well. Good deal. So, thank well, you. We're happy that you're here. So happy that you're here. I'll spend the next couple of seconds um, introducing Katie and Jill. Um, so we are so excited about our partnership with the Brain Health Institute and the Center for Brain Health at UT Dallas. And Katie and Jill are coming back today to visit with us again. Um, Katie comes to us. Um, she is, um, her specialty is enhancing cognitive performance. Um, she's facilitated high performance cognitive training programs with students, athletes, military personnel, first responders, and corporate executives. And Jillian um, has worked as an attorney in the area of corporate litigation before joining the Center for Brain Health, where she has blended her experience in law with her clinical knowledge to develop cognitive training programs for law students and attorneys. And so uh, Katie Hines and Jillian Hill, welcome. Thank you for coming back and being with us today. Of course. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thank you so much for having us, Christy. And Christy, the whole reason why Christy even knows about us, well, I don't know how you actually initially found out about us, Christy. Maybe you told me at some point, but Christy went through our cognitive training program here in Dallas and is so kind of, was so innovative to find a way to bring us to South Plains. So we're so grateful to be doing these, um, these opportunities for you guys. And we hope we'll have another one in August as well. Um, and so we hope that you guys continue to join us because, yeah, we're just very excited to be part of this initiative, this very innovative initiative that Christy's kind of brought us to South Plains to do. I'm also um, a tech grad, so I have a soft spot in my heart for West Texas. And uh, yeah, just so excited to be with you guys again today. Um, so I'm going to share some slides with you guys. If I can get it going here. That's not what it's supposed to look like. Hold on. Can you see that, Jill? I think it's just sharing on a different screen is the problem. Yeah, it was just, it was saying Katie Hines is sharing, but it didn't show the actual slide on my side. Now is it showing up? Yeah, it's in, it's in um, notes or review mode instead of presenter mode? Hold on. This is the problem with having three screens. 
<laughs> Hold on, let me get it on the right one. Now is it showing up right? That looks right. I still don't know why it's on this screen though. This is so weird. <laughs> turn. So the first thing that we want you guys to do today, so today Jill and I are really going to focus on how to calibrate your cognitive resources. And if you're like, what the heck do they mean by that? Okay, if you don't know yet, we will get into what that means. Uh, but before we jump in, I just want to ask you guys and just take notes kind of on your own. Hopefully you have a notepad and something to write with so that you can um, refer back to it. But first we want you to write down what the word or like what comes to mind when you even think of the word calibration. So take a moment and just jot down what calibration means. And then once you've done that, think about how calibration could relate to brain performance. All right, so no matter kind of what you guys already are conceptually thinking about in terms of calibration and how it might relate to to brain performance, we're going to kind of jump into how it relates and how to kind of leverage and calibrate your brain performance every day, if I can get it to go. All right, so calibration, you guys might have, have hit on something along these lines, but it's really all about assessing, setting, and adjusting um, the amount and degree of cognitive effort required for varying tasks and objectives. So the thing that I think is so empowering about this concept of calibration as it relates to your mental energy and your brain performance is that you have some control. So kind of leveraging and kind of grasping on to some control over how you are expending your mental resources every day. Uh, I think the most common thing that, or one of the more common things that we hear um, from people that we work with is like, yeah, no, I just have no control over my day. I have no control over my mental energy. And by the end of the day, I'm just completely wiped out. Well, we hope that some of these tools we're going to talk about with you today help you feel like you have some control. And we're not saying that you're going to have uh, control of everything that happens in your day or everything that you're required to do that's going to zap some of your cognitive energy. However, we just want to encourage you to gain a little bit more control over how you're expending your cognitive energy every day, recognizing that you don't have an endless amount. So unfortunately, even I think that people say, well, yeah, I realize that as I get older, but even when we're young, we don't have an endless amount of cognitive resources. So it's up to you to kind of dedicate um, or decide where you want to expend those cognitive resources every day. Another big part of this is that it helps you build stress resilience. So we talked a lot about stress last time, but there is there are a lot of cognitive stressors that play a factor into our um, our ability to, or our stress levels every day. And those are typically the ones that we do have a little bit more control over than the more environmental stressors. And that last bullet point is really just saying, if you're not gaining control of your cognitive resources, oftentimes you don't ever really even get to de think deeply and really leverage your frontal networks, which is kind of the frontal part of your brain that's in your frontal lobe. And that is really the part of your brain that's important for deep thinking, decision-making, problem solving, things that are very important for us to be successful. Um, it's hard to do that if you're constantly inundated with low level tasks and not expending your cognitive energy on the things that are really going to push you forward. All right, so we talked, like I said, about stress quite a bit last time, but um, here are just some, some data points for you guys in terms of stress and why it's important to gain some control over your, your mental energy and how to calibrate that just how high of a percentage it is that a lot of primary care doctor visits are related to stress. Um, I think everyone can, can kind of relate to the fact that typically we do experience stress in our job. It becomes more of a problem when it's that chronic stress. So where it's consistent stress every day that's hard for you to gain control over, 
And so even 33% is, is a lot to be experiencing that chronic stress. Um, kind of obviously the numbers of, of how much it costs um, just because of work-related stress and just a um, amount of loss in productivity. So stress and just a lack of planning and calibration of your cognitive resources do tend to, um, to negatively impact your productivity. Um, and then I think this is something that a lot of people relate to as well as how hard it is to sleep and, and really get and take advantage of restful periods whenever you are stressed. So a huge part of minimizing your stress is gaining some control over this, your cognitive, calibrating your cognitive energy, because again, that is something you can have control over instead of those more environmental stressors that aren't as much in your control. All right, now I'm gonna try to pull up another poll. I saw that someone said that they were um, relating to me with my three screens and how challenging that can be sometimes. All right. Okay, so go ahead and answer this question. So how much time do you spend daily taking in information that's unrelated to work or your high priority tasks? Um, and just on, an, on average, how much time do you spend doing those things daily? All right, it looks like most people have answered. So I'm gonna go ahead and share with you guys what everyone said. Um, so I'm gonna to need to take notes from the three people that said zero to one hour. because I wouldn't put myself in that category even though I wish I was in that category. Um, but yes, it looks like it's most of you guys fall in somewhere here in the middle. Um, and why we ask this is because these, I think you can, if you consider these tasks or these examples that we gave you, these tend to be things that we have some control over. We have some control over how much time we spend focused on those things. And a lot of times we just don't even uh, think about the purpose of why we're engaging with those. We just kind of continue to flood our mind with more information, even during our downtime. So that kind of brings me to, if I can get out of this, back to the screen our first kind of what we want to talk about and discuss as um, something that you need to consider when you are thinking about calibrating your mental energy. And that is information overload. So a lot of those things uh, that we just showed on the screen were related to technology, right? So technology is a huge enabler for information overload. I don't know if you guys can relate to the fact that even when you get five minutes or you get a break from something that you're doing or you're in between meetings, the first thing you might do is grab your phone. Not because you need to look at your phone, right? Not because oftentimes you did receive a call or you did receive something that you needed to respond to, but instead you, it, it was kind of a habit, right? We tend to very passively grab our phones, start scrolling through social media, start checking our emails, start maybe even looking through our messages to see if anyone's texted us because even in this kind of a lot of times in our culture, we have this immediate response in this. We feel this need to be immediately responsive to work, to family members, um, to friends. Um, and so a lot of times we do this not because it's necessary, but because we have trained our mind to crave this constant intake of information. And something that we really uh, like to, to tell you guys and kind of we'll get into this even more with like the, the actual tip but that less oftentimes is more for the brain. So with information, with tasks, if you can be, if you can filter the information better, you're going to be better off. Um, so even not, not just with information, even how often you are checking your phone, maybe calling yourself out whenever you do realize, oh, I'm just grabbing my phone out of habit, not because I actually need to, to check it. Um, because every time that you pick up your phone and you start scrolling through social media, even though that feels very passive, that is still asking your brain to take in a lot of information. So it's still not really giving your brain a rest from encoding information. So you have all these tasks that are very important that you have to get done. And in the middle of those tasks, you're cramming in more information. 
which tends to increase your stress and make you less productive on the tasks that you really need to get done. So it's so important to be able to filter, to prevent that feeling of being overwhelmed, uh, feeling constantly busy, but not productive. So getting through a lot of maybe small tasks, but never getting to those tasks that are really important to you and gonna really make you feel productive. And oftentimes it prevents us from making decisions and taking actions. I mean, when you're stressed and when you feel overwhelmed, it's hard to say, okay, I think this is the best decision or I'm gonna move forward um, with this idea because oftentimes we're too overwhelmed with the smaller things to even do that. So what we encourage you guys to do is really think about down selecting. So not just focus on being you know, busy, but instead how can you be more productive? So you need to be more strategic with your mental energy and maybe even delegate or say no whenever you're presented with tasks that aren't important or that someone else could do uh, so that you can dedicate more of that cognitive energy to the tasks that are going to be important to you and that are going to push you forward. And same thing with information. So when you're taking in information, and I know that you guys, you know, teach and that you present a lot of information. Um, so I know it's probably extremely hard to present the information in a way that you really want to present it in direct in a direct way if you're taking in all of the information instead of deciding what's really important. What's gonna be important? What are the important messages for you to get across? That's gonna be hard to do if you're taking in all the information you can. So how can you filter information a little better, put down technology, put down the things that are just flooding your brain with excess unimportant information or unrelated information so that you can dedicate a lot of that cognitive energy to that information that's gonna be important to you. Um, and then I think it's important just to think about the information you are taking in. You know, I mean, is it, is it kind of, is it purposeful? Is there, are you getting something out of it? Like, we're not going to sit here and tell you, oh, you shouldn't be on social media or you shouldn't talk to your family members during work. That is not what we're saying. It's just recognizing that you need to have a purpose as to maybe why you are deciding at that point to take in that information and to kind of continue that information intake. If that's your goal at that moment and that's important to you, great. It's more about just being mindful about why you're taking in the information that you're taking in and setting it down and setting it aside whenever you can. Yeah, I was going to say something to that point. I think, you know, everybody can probably relate to or, you know, be guilty of, right? Um, like Katie mentioned earlier, if there's any downtime at all, our hand tends to reach for the phone and just pick it up. And so it's more of a mindless information consumption, right? We click on those apps that we routinely check. We go back to the same sources and sites that maybe we've checked even just an hour ago or 30 minutes ago. Um, and often we see the same things and we kind of, so it's a redundancy of information, right? It's like, there's nothing necessarily new. We're checking to see if there is something new, but even if there was, was it something that we really needed to engage with at that moment? You know, so a lot of times, is it a purposeful engagement of information is, you know, a different question than, is it something that I like and enjoy? Because you can like and enjoy it and make time for that. But if that is taking up so much of your time that the purpose is kind of lost, right? So I'm checking it just for the sake of checking it or just to see what's on there versus, hey, I'm going to go and, and, you know, look on my social media for a, a specified amount of time later in the day, because I just kind of like that as a little bit of downtime, you know, some more mindless interaction for, for the brain. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of times we, we continue going back to sources, to sites, to apps, to pages that we may not even really care what the content is, or maybe even we've gotten to where the content annoys us, or we would go back there and it ends up being something that kind of, you know, um, irritates us in some way, but we still go back. And so then we have to kind of stop and take an inventory of that and ask ourselves, why? Is there a way that we could eliminate some of that redundancy? Is it still accomplishing the purpose that I want it to accomplish? And if not, could I eliminate or reduce it? And I think like Heather, it's funny you put in the Q&A, like it's ironic that you're on Zoom again, probably for more information, right? So, and I think that it's, uh, at least I hope that the information we're providing will help you with some of this information overload. But to Jill's point and kind of what it's saying up here is if you find a purpose in the information, like then it's not, it's not wasted energy, right? So if, if you are watching Jill and I's presentation today to, to try to improve maybe some processes that you, or to, that you already have and improve your brain health and performance, that is kind of your purpose. And so it's not so much of hopefully wasted cognitive energy. 
it, we're really talking about those things that might not be as beneficial to your job or your home life or things that you don't know kind of why you're taking in the information. It's just mindless. Those are the kinds of things that we really want to encourage you guys to just be more aware of. Not that you have to eliminate them, um, but just uh, be more aware of them and try to reduce them when you can. And then that last part is really, and we talked about this a little bit last time, but stress creates this sense of kind of where you're constantly at this heightened level. Um, and we really want you guys to, to know that the brain is, it's so important for the brain to have moments of calmness. And you can't can't have these moments of calmness. And we talked last time a little bit about brain breaks and making sure that you're taking kind of some time to disconnect. And that's so important because that does build this, these at least calm moments for your brain that create resilience, which means that when you are presented with something that's actually very stressful and a, maybe it's a big decision you're having to make, your brain can be a lot more resilient in that moment of stress, in that big decision. If you're constantly at this heightened level of stress, it's going to be hard to bounce back. It's going to be hard to be resilient if you're kind of staying at that level. So this is just another way to minimize that. It's being more aware of the information you're taking in and trying to at least minimize that mindless intake of information when you can. Yeah, and in constant intake mode, right? So when we're just taking it in, sometimes we call drinking from the fire hose, right? Just take in, take in, take in, and there's no shutoff valve, there's no filtering, then that's not an environment in which your brain can step back, regenerate, recharge, and, and be calm or resilient. So it is, you know, just creating more space for that. Okay, so as we get into um, some of the next tips and strategies we'll talk about, I um, want you to think to yourself, or you could jot it down if you have some paper, think of a large task or project that you've been meaning to get done. This might be a work task or project that you've been assigned or that you an initiative that you need to advance forward, or it could be just a personal, like at home, something that you, oh, I've been meaning to get that done. And it's, it's so, it's a big, you know, a, a big project or undertaking. And then just maybe jot down or think of some barriers that have kept you from accomplishing that, whatever those are, you know, internal or external barriers. What are those? Okay, so hopefully you have some ideas in mind about these tasks or projects, um, because we're going to talk about this concept that I hope that most people can relate to and see where we're coming from on this, that the idea and the sense of being overwhelmed often leads to being unmotivated, right? So being unable to access the motivation to actually start something. So we asked you to think of a large task or project that you wanted to advance forward because oftentimes the tasks and projects that we have in our head as something that we need to get done are so big that they actually overwhelm our brain and kill our motivation. So have you ever, and maybe the, the task or project that you thought of will fit into this category where it's like, have you ever had something that it's just so enormous that it's hard to really identify a first step to take towards it or it's so big that you know that it's gonna take so long to accomplish that you then put off starting to accomplish it because it's just a lot to think about. Um, you know, so the brain really, you know, it's, it's wired to enjoy meeting goals and kind of hitting milestones. And so we love a measurable goal. We love a checkbox that we can check off, right? And so it's, you know, why do we like that? Because it actually triggers what we call our neuropharmacy. So there's this, you know, uh, universe of, of chemicals and hormones and different neurotransmitters in our body that our brain is, is capable of producing as a result of different stimuli and interactions. And so when we meet a goal and we accomplish something and check that box, then the positive neurotransmitters are released that signal a reward and an accomplishment. And it makes us feel good. It makes us feel proud of ourselves and accomplished and productive. And it also triggers motivation to do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So 
It's kind of like, you know, establishing a habit of going to the gym. That very first day may be hard, but then when you feel how good it feels to get that done and to have accomplished that, you're more likely to keep doing it. And so that's, you know, it's a process within the brain that has to do with our neurotransmitters and we can take advantage of it by creating the environment to, to help ourselves to do that. Because if we have a project that's just too large, too nebulously defined, it's so big that we can't really wrap our head around it, then what is the measurable goal that we're working towards, right? How can we make that more, you know, more defined, more specific so that the brain can have something to check off? Um, so, you know, for example, if you had something in your head, you know, maybe if you were responsible for some financial goals, and it's like, well, I need to reduce my, my budget by 20%. Well, that's a pretty big goal. What does that mean? You know, how, what kind of categories do I need to break this down into, right? If I were just to say, I'm going to sit down and reduce my budget by 20%, how, do, how does that mean to work towards that goal? You know, or, you know, even something at home, it's like, I need to completely clean out the garage and be able to move my car into it again. That's a goal I need to set for myself, by the way. But, um, <laughs> but you know, that sort of thing is, it, sometimes it can be so enormous that we can't take that first step. And so the solution that we wanna talk about related to that is just really specific and defined goal setting so that our brain can take advantage of that neurotransmitter network that likes to accomplish and get a reward from meeting a goal. So break your tasks and projects into manageable, well-defined chunks, right? So if you have something that's supposed to be a semester long initiative that you're advancing forward, and you're trying to plan for it, maybe, you know, even planning your, your class content for next semester or something like that, instead of expecting yourself to sit down and get it done all in one sitting, you know, that can be something that we tend to procrastinate because it doesn't seem accomplishable in that amount of time. And so trying to break it down and say, you know, today I'm going to work on, you know, weeks one through three, rather than trying to plan out or map out the whole thing, right? So break it down into a really well-defined chunk. And actually, a lot of research has shown that the human brain isn't, uh, isn't really wired for deep uh, focus where you have to really recruit your mental energy for more than about a 45 minute period of focus. And so we call that the 45 minute focus rule. So, you know, keep that in mind when you're breaking down these projects into manageable chunks and define goals. Think about, is this something that if I focused on this particular aspect of the goal or task that I could accomplish within 45 minutes? Can I do this outline? Can I map out weeks one through three on my syllabus in 45 minutes? Reasonably, I know that you know I have the content, I just need to fit it in and really write out the schedule. If that will take me about 45 minutes, then that is a good manageable goal to define for that period of time. If it seems like, no, there's no way I could accomplish that in 45 minutes, even if I was really focused on it, then that goal is too big, right? That goal needs to be then broken down into something that's more well-defined. And so it doesn't mean that you have to segment your entire day into 45 minute chunks of time. It just means that when you really need to dig in and focus on something that you really want to or need to advance forward that requires your, your thinking, your deeper thinking, then try to keep that to an identified chunk of time and remember that the 45 minute focus rule says that you shouldn't try to say, I'm not getting up from this table until I finish this, even if it takes me five hours, that's gonna start to be counterproductive pretty quickly. Okay. Now. Okay, so think about this for yourself and uh, maybe we should have put it in a poll so we could actually see your responses since you're on webinar, but just for now, think about it to yourself. Do you tend to be uh, one or the other type, type here? So do you tend to hit the ground running each day and jump right into the first task on your list? Maybe you have written it down, maybe you haven't written it down. You just kind of you know sit down and, and get to it each day. Or do you tend to be somebody who is a little bit more of a planner, creating a plan of action, you know, to help you tackle your daily tasks? So I think sometimes we can be a mix of both, right? Sometimes we can have really good intentions to be one and then we end up being the other. Um, but just thinking about how you typically approach your to-do list on a daily basis and the energy and time you spend or not spend, um, planning for how you're going to accomplish those tasks rather than just getting to it and accomplishing them, right? So we're going to talk about uh, some, some kind of 
directive hints towards towards helping you get some structure around that um, that goal of accomplishing your tasks each day. So um, also consider that tasks take as long as you give them. Okay, so that's right. That's a pretty obvious statement, but it actually there's a little bit more to it than you think. You know, when you hear tasks take as long as you give them, well, of course they do. But what does that mean for you in accomplishing your tasks? If I start a task and I don't have a well-defined goal, like we just talked about, I haven't set up my parameters so that I know what I'm aiming to accomplish and what period of time and what at a bigger picture, what that end goal is gonna look like. If I don't have that and I just jump right in, I don't really know where I'm going. I, I'm kind of a little bit directionless. I don't have a, you know, a really good grasp of when I have met that goal or milestone. And so that task might take longer than it necessarily needed to, right? So when I'm not taking the time to think, how much time am I willing to devote to this? How much time do I actually have to afford to devote to this? Um, then I'm gonna not be as successful in moving towards that goal because um, that gives me a game plan. And that helps me take control of my tasks rather than letting the task control me and feel like I'm constantly running to catch up with my to-do list all day long. Yeah, so I we're going to talk about okay. a little, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's okay for, like we told you guys the 45 minute rule, but we want that to you to perceive that as more of a max, right? So even if like, don't just say 45 minutes because we said 45 minutes max, if something should really only take you 15 minutes, set aside 15 minutes for it, you know, or let's say you only have 30 minutes um, to devote to something in between class sessions or something. It's okay for it to only be 30 minutes too, as long as you can kind of decide, all right, this is a task that I can conceivably get done in this 30 minutes, or it's a task I could at least get started on well within this 30 minutes. We just don't want you guys to try to push it for 45 minutes. We don't want you to, to Jill, I think Jill already said this, but like sitting down until it gets done, because that is not... That is not something that our brain likes. That's not, that is not a goal that sounds reachable is, hey, I'm gonna sit down until this project is done. Cause a lot of times you're gonna have to break it up into smaller chunks cause you're gonna lose focus and not be able to accomplish it. And during that time, at least. Yeah, absolutely. So Katie's okay, kind of hinting at this next tip or, or strategy that we're gonna talk about which is setting strategic parameters. So it's a little bit more nuanced than setting the goals. Like we talked about earlier, breaking things into identifiable goals. The strategic parameters really goes back to this idea of calibration. And so I don't know whenever you guys thought about the definition of calibration when Katie brought it up at the very beginning. A lot of people say that that, you know, signals to them something about preparation, about, you know, identifying the tools necessary, making sure that you know, every system is at the ready and calibrate. You think of calibration, I always think about it kind of like in a, um, the sense of, you know, like a vehicle or something, right? So like everything is calibrated to be able to, to go and, and run smoothly. And so thinking about what that means for your brain and strategic parameter setting, calibrating your mental energy means that you don't just expect your, your brain to be able to accomplish everything in a day without having a plan for you to be able to do that and without you taking a more active role in identifying, you know, how much energy is this going to take me? How much time is this going to take me? Do I have that time available? And if not, how can I carve out that time to make it available so that I can make the progress I need? Um, so, you know, I think the first most important step for this that we like to talk about is kind of like this reasonability, uh, you know, what's reasonable. Um, assessment, if you will. And so sitting down and saying, you know, I need to plan out a, a syllabus or I need to kind of, uh, you know, read this content so I can see what test questions I'm going to be extracting from it. You know, I need to plan and write out those test questions, whatever that task is, you know, especially for the tasks that are, are part of your routine work, you know, reasonably how much time something should take you. If I have the information here in front of me, and I singularly focused on it. So kind of ask yourself, in an ideal world, if I were to focus on this and give it the attention it deserves and needs, how much time should that reasonably take me? So for example, I write reports sometimes. And if I have all of the data and information in front of me, I know that a report start to finish shouldn't take me more than 35 minutes, right? And so the end of this particular type, you know, and so you may have tasks where you're, you're well prepared for the task, you've got the information at hand, 
And so ask yourself, you know, can I accomplish this in 20 minutes? Is this something that takes me about 20 minutes? And then be accountable to yourself, right? So that's the thing that's going to actually help you to move forward towards the task is identifying that time and then basically competing against yourself to make sure that you accomplish it, right? It's like, if I say this reasonably shouldn't take me more than 30 minutes, and then I'm sitting here working on it two hours later, something has gone wrong, right? Like I have gotten distracted. I've started multitasking. I've jumped off onto something else and come back to it. And the more that I set that parameter ahead of time and identify what I call a stop doing point. So if I'm like, you know, I'm going to start writing this report at 10 a.m. And by 1045, I'll be hitting save and closing it out on my, on my screen, right? If I identify that stop doing point up front, that's the parameter that I need to basically keep myself accountable throughout that focus period. So if I only have 20 minutes of focus period, I'm going to pick a, you know, a task that I can reasonably complete within that 20 minute point of time so that at my stop doing point, I can feel like I've productively moved forward on something. Um, and it just really helps, you know, sometimes it's trial and error. Sometimes it's like, this is a newer task for me, right? I'm, maybe I'm new at this job, or maybe this is something, a, a topic or subject area that I haven't really delved into before. So for you, for that, it might take a little bit of time and say, well, I think this probably should take me around 30 minutes to do. I'm going to give it a shot. And then if that was wildly inaccurate, if it was just like, wow, actually I only needed 15 minutes when I was really focused on it. Now I know in the future. Or nope, didn't even scratch the surface, not even close to finishing it. I clearly need to break that down into more manageable chunks to try next time. So you can really start to calibrate like that. Yeah, I just think it's important to, to know, we might have said this last time too, but deadlines are a good thing. So I think sometimes people are like, yeah, deadlines make me stressed or, you know, but a lot of times deadlines kind of produce this good stress. They produce this... Uh, Plan and it, it's really firing. It's, it's keeping us focused. Our brain knows I've got to get this done by this time. The problem is that oftentimes we let those deadlines be dictated by other people. And then we procrastinate to where we're so shoved up against the deadline that it becomes a bad stress because now we're chronically stressing over it because it's coming up, it's looming, but we haven't really started on it. And so how do you create these smaller deadlines for these bigger projects so that you can kind of leverage that adrenaline and your brain really staying focused because you know you got to get it done, but you're not so stressed about it because it's not the, oh, if this doesn't get done by this point, my boss is going to be the one that's, you know, hounding me about it. Instead, how do you set up to Jill's point, these time points of like, I'm going to get this done during this time. I'm going to set a timer. Or I'm going to try to keep myself accountable. Another thing that Jill touched on is just, I can't tell you how many times people are like, oh, well, doing this task takes me two hours or three hours. And we're like, does it take you two or three hours because you are distracted the whole time? <laughs> because a lot of times that tends to be the case, right? So it's hard to even gauge how long something takes you unless you start to minimize those distractions, give yourself some really focused time to dedicate to that task. And then you'll really figure out how long something takes you. And it tends to take a lot less time uh, if you're distracted and you have kind of a goal of how long you're going to be focused on that. On that task. Yeah, and this is, I think that point exactly is really applicable, you know, to us in our everyday life, but also to you guys as educators to really communicate that and help your students to take ownership of that as well. Because I think that's, you know, really one of the top complaints of I have a, I have a high school stepson and, and um, also, you know, just have a ton of, of friends with kids who have homework, you know, homework is one of the stressors, right? And so these are things that, you know, it can seem unmanageable if you're doing it piecemeal, toggling back and forth between a number of different things and you haven't really taken that time to calibrate. How much time do I have to spend on this? How much time should it reasonably take me? Okay, now how am I moving forward with this goal, right? So this is a great strategy for students as well to say, you know, wouldn't you love to be able to actually spend that time on social media or spend that time hanging out with your friends without having all of these homework tasks or this preparation looming over you. And the way to accomplish that is to really set these parameters for yourself to say, if I was really focused only on this task and completing this homework or completing this project, 
could I get that done in a lot less time and then spend time solely on the more pleasurable, enjoyable thing that I'm trying to get to instead of sprinkling that in and doing it piecemeal. Okay, I'm going to read a page and then I'll text five friends or, you know, read a page and then scroll social media for 15 minutes. And then it ends up taking you, you know, a 45 minute homework assignment takes you four hours. Uh, so it's definitely, you know, that's a skill that can be developed uh, in the, you know, academic years. And it's something that carries over. It doesn't end there, right? It's something that we can all still really benefit from in our everyday life, even if we're not studying for something. This is still something that we all encounter as things that we need to move forward and need to keep ourselves accountable to do in a reasonable fashion so that it doesn't just get out of control and, and take over for us. And I don't know, Jill, if you saw Erica's question, but yeah, so Erica asked kind of, you know, what this looks like for students and how to, uh, you know, what's due for the week and letting them create a task list. So I think, right, that's totally up to you as an educator, how much help you want to provide students on helping them be more intentional about deadlines. You know, I think that you could definitely put it on them. You could be, you know, you could say, hey, this is when this is due, but it's not going to be a good idea for you to try to cram it at the end because it takes a good portion of time. So you might want to separate it into 40 minute, 45 minute chunks over the next couple of weeks to try to get it done. Or it might help um, if you want to put in a little more effort and help them out a little bit more. It might help to say, okay, by this date, you really need to at least be to this point. You know, like on this project, it's a good idea for you to be to this point by this date. On this next week, all right, it's a good idea for you to be at this point. So it's totally up to you on how much help you want to provide with that. I think you could go both ways. You could provide a little more assistance and set more deadlines, or you could just be informative and tell, or, you know, tell them kind of the science behind it and say, you're not going to be able to sit and focus for hours at a time. It'd be a lot easier for you to get this done if you break it up into 45 minute chunks of work. Yeah, and I think the more you scaffold it at the outset, right? So if you have a new, you know, brand new semester, brand new students and things like that, and you can start setting this expectation for them, right? And you can start saying, hey, let's all start thinking about when we give you these reading assignments or when we give you these projects, how much time should each thing reasonably take you? Like take this first week and every single night that you do your homework, try to really refine that estimate, right? So what did it really take you if you need to read a chapter? What did it really take you if you need to research and, and write you know, a section of a, a paper or something? and then start to really build that within them and say, now, you know, now it's gonna be a little bit more up to you to, to really set these parameters and, and say, I have the experience now. I know how much time it should reasonably take me. I need to identify those stop doing points and also just be really careful about the way that I, you know, keep myself accountable versus letting myself get distracted because then my estimate of what is reasonable is going to be blown out of the water because I'm not gonna be focused on that task at hand. All right, so we'll, we're gonna try to leave some time for questions, you guys, if you haven't had a chance to type questions in the Q&A, but obviously feel free to as they come up as well. So we're gonna give you guys a few minutes. So we really like to, I know this is webinar, so we can't interact too much with you guys, at least not in real time, but we do like to make this kind of interactive. We like to challenge people to immediately start to put this into play for yourself because Jill and I have given, a, given examples, but Jill and I aren't educators and we don't know exactly what you guys go through on a daily basis and how calibrating your cognitive resources looks for you. So we want you to start kind of personalizing it. So I'm gonna give you guys about mm, probably three, three to four minutes just to think about kind of the three, the three things we've talked about today and how it relates to you. So the first one is really about how to downregulate that information intake. So maybe it is first just identifying what is that kind of go-to habit you have that's flooding your brain with excess information? Maybe the first step is identifying that and trying to think about ways to even just minimize it. We're not saying eliminate, even just minimize the flood of that excess information source. Um, the second one was goal setting. So Jill talked about this with setting those more kind of condensed goals, right? So having maybe these big goals, then breaking it up into these maybe 45 minute chunks and little smaller parts, pieces to your goals that's more accomplishable, that sends you that kind of rush of dopamine um, and sends kind of you into that feeling of productive, feeling of reward because you're consistently achieving those smaller goals. And then the last one was strategic parameters like Jill just talked about. So 
um, making sure that you're not, you know, sitting down and, and giving yourself as long as you can possibly give yourself in that moment to accomplish a task, but instead kind of think about how, how long it should take you um, and making sure that you're sticking to that. And then also creating a, hey, by this point, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm, I'm going to kind of stop doing it, take a break maybe, and then come back on a, at a different time. So consider all three of those. We want you to at least right now to choose one of them and think about two to three actionable ways to implement that tip into your daily life. All right. So I'm going to give you guys about three minutes and then we're going to open it up for questions. So if you have questions about this activity or anything we've talked about today, we'll open it up at that point. But I'm going to first give you guys about three minutes to consider this for yourself. All right, before we kind of open it up, it, just as I was thinking through this, I remembered something that I think is helpful, uh, specifically with the down regulation of information, is even if this is something that you find value in, whether it just be for entertainment or whatever, even just deciding at what point in the day you want to make that a goal of yours is extremely valuable. So even if you're like, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm, I, I enjoy getting on social media, I enjoy feeling connected, but I'm gonna wait until lunchtime to do that, or I'm gonna wait until after work hours to do that. Even just doing that and being intentional about when you're accessing that information can be very valuable in terms of the constant intake of information. All right, so now we just wanna open it up to you guys. Like what, what questions do you have? Did, did walking through this um, kind of even bring up some more questions? That is a good question. Um, I don't know if there is an article specifically about that. Jill, do you? I don't know either if there is one and I don't know if it would, hmm, that's, that's a good question. I bet we could find something. <laughs> we could probably find something. Little tip sheets or something that have been created for students in the past. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. We we may it may not be an article, but it may be more um, like when we've worked with collegiate or grad student populations in the past. We'll often give them kind of a one pager um, that has some of these tips broken down and kind of the what, the why, and the how of them. And I'm pretty sure that's on some of those, uh, so we could find that for sure. Thank you, Denise. Yeah, no, I I forgot that you guys can't see the question. So Erica had asked. Um, is there an article on our website about breaking things into 45-minute chunks or goals for the brain that you could share with students? 
And so uh, we definitely have communicated that to students, but to Jill's point, I think it's been more in like tip sheets and, and things of that nature. Uh, because I, as you guys probably know, we get a lot of pushback in that with students. Because <laughs> another thing that we will, this is opening up a can of worms with only five minutes, left, but um, another thing that we'll encourage students to do is give themselves times without music on. So we really encourage them. There's a lot of science behind the fact that even though you're not truly engaging with the music, that's still a lot of information that your brain is naturally processing. Even if you're blocking it out to study, it's still wasting some of that cognitive resource just to block out the music because your brain recognizes that this has nothing to do with what you're studying, but yet it's still being flooded with more information. So that's something else we get a lot of pushback on, but I think that that's something that honestly, it goes back to Jill's point. What is their motivator? It's usually spending more time with their friends and less time studying. So, hey, if you just spend 30 minute chunks without music, then blast your music all you want, but try to separate these 30 minute chunks where you can really knock out a lot in a period of time so that you're not spending so much time and effort studying or reading. Erica's like, eek, thanks. Yeah, who knows if they'll listen to you, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth a shot, you know? And I think that a lot of times it's one thing to tell them, but another thing for them to just try it for anybody, for any of us, even if we're not students anymore, for us to just try something and actually see the difference. You know, when a student tries kind of singular focus studying without a distraction present for even 20 or 30 minutes and sees that they can accomplish something during that period of time that might've otherwise taken them an hour or more, there's the reward and there's the motivation, you know? Yeah, so someone asked about white noise there. There is there are levels to distraction. There are levels to uh, how much effort you're having to put in to block something. So white noise is definitely the lowest of the sound kind of levels. So a lot of people will also ask, well, if I work in a cubicle setting or I work around a lot of other people, sometimes that's more distracting than noise, 100%. Yeah, conversations are like the top of the distraction kind of list. So if you can hear other people's conversations, that's extremely distracting because your brain's naturally going to go, ooh, what are they talking about over there? Is this something I need to hear? Is this something I need to pay attention to? So that's really high. Uh, so yes, like any, any form of noise is still something your brain is having to work a little bit to block out. But I would say white noise is definitely the furthest down the list. So it kind of goes white noise, music without lyrics, music with lyrics, conversations, right? So find whatever is the least distracting environment for you. Other people will say, well, white noise helps me block out my own thoughts. Okay, so that if that is you, then that's fine. However, a lot of times what we've found is people will end up saying, oh yeah, I just, I'm not used to silence. So sometimes you have to build in this getting used to silence and your brain getting used to that. Because if you've constantly had input, then your brain's going to crave that because that's what it's experienced. You wire your brain to how you use it. So if you are constantly flooding information and your brain's gonna be like, ah, I need more information. And so your thoughts are gonna go crazy. Um, so try it even without any noise, but yes, white noise, if you want a little bit of noise is the best in terms of least distracting. Yeah, I think about that hierarchy of kind of the noise levels that, that Katie was talking about and think about our students who study, you know, try to read something that's, you know, really complex content in a coffee shop what are they around? They're around music with lyrics. They're around conversation. So they're at the kind of the top end of that, you know, distraction hierarchy of, of sound and, and, you know, environmental pollution, essentially. Um, and, and that's really tough to, to be able to recruit your mental energy to focus at the level that you need. I just don't, I've never understood that. I mean, any, <laughs> I'm like, stop studying at Starbucks. <laughs> Good for your brain. Now, whether they listen or not, I don't know, but we, we try. Uh, yeah, Ron, I appreciate you saying, you know, not having your phone by, by the bed. That's definitely a contributor, right, to that temptation of flooding information, especially when you're trying to kind of relax and calm down before bed. Um, I, li I don't know what, okay, you said you read the paper, I guess, um, have coffee and then do a crossword puzzle and then make your bed and then have another cup of coffee, very important, and then do email. And then plan your day. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's helpful to kind of have these, um, you know, these structured kind of plans for how you start your day and, and trying to at least find times for certain things 
so that you're not tempted to do it as much all throughout your day. So, you know, plan time for reading the paper, plan time for watching the news, plan time for looking at your phone, instead of just having these periods where you're constantly kind of craving that in the middle of work tasks or things you're trying to do that are different. Yeah, and if you think about it, just, you know, routines are really just another mechanism for goal setting and setting parameters, because each time you follow that routine and accomplish the things that you know are on your routine, that's your brain accomplishing things and, and feeling like, okay, I checked the box. You know, this is making, this is making me happy. And that's what a brain likes. And I'm going to make one more comment just because I thought about Ron's email thing. Uh, even just trying to find specific times of the day where you check your email can be helpful because it's, if you're kind of constantly checking it, or if it's something that, you know, isn't as well thought out or planned, then oftentimes those distract us from the tasks that we have at hand. So, uh, to at least help you minimize distractions and not continue to flood um, your brain with information, even finding specific times where you try to check your email during the day. Um, but yeah, I mean, the one-off checking is is really tough. <laughs> and I would just say overall, like, thank you guys so much for being here. First of all, again, please watch the one before if this is something that interests you, especially if stress and how stress impacts your brain interests you. We will never, uh, whenever we work with you guys, we'll never say that you're gonna be perfect. We're not perfect. What we encourage you to do is just kind of reach for this continuous improvement. How can I gain a little more control over my cognitive resources? How can I gain a little bit more control over my tasks and how much I'm being distracted and how much information I'm taking in? Even just a small kind of change in a, in a positive way can have a big impact. Thank you guys so much. Absolutely. Feel free to reach out to us. If you think of a question later, our emails are here. Um, I know Christy will put this online for, for you guys to you can watch again. You can tell a friend about it. They can watch it um, and then go check out the other talks as well. Yeah, we encourage you to share this with your friends and family. We think this information is so important. Um, we will provide the link to this um, very shortly. So watch your email for that information. Jill and Katie, thank you again for a great talk. I have some great takeaways. I have in big, bold letters, a calm brain is a resilient brain <laughs> and I have no chill. So I'm going to, I'm going to work on that. <laughs> thank you all so much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Heather put the link um, to the first one. I don't know, um, Christy, I don't know how to share it with everyone on here. So I don't know if there's okay. a, like maybe just sending it to them via email. I'm sure you have all their emails. I do. And we have a list of participants. So I tell you what we'll do is we'll follow up with that link and make sure that everybody has that. So that's not a problem at all. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Christy. And thank you everyone for being here today. Let us know if y'all have any questions. Thank you again. Thanks. Thanks.